Uh, Amy Hubby with Mishnah, in case you didn't hear who I was over the music, but so happy to be here. And thank you all for coming to the session today to talk about housing. Um, you know, we are in the midst of a housing crisis, and I mentioned this last year at the session, um, but we're still in a housing crisis. In fact, last year, I think I mentioned something to the tune of we are about 150,000 housing units short. And this year, I'm here with the great news that now we're about 190,000 uh, housing units short. So, you know, it's still a big issue in the state that we need to address. Uh, I have a lot of people ask me, you know, our population in our state hasn't grown that much. How is it that we're that short on housing units? And so I'm going to just give you a couple points to address that. One. Um, in our state, in, in many states across the country, our housing um, size has shrunk. So it used to be over four people per house, and now we're just over two people per home. So you can imagine why we need more housing units in that way. Um, also, uh, we've had an uptick in Michigan families uh, having second homes. Um, so uh, vacation, or in Michigan, we like to say up north homes. Um, we've had an increase in short-term rentals also across our state, uh, which have taken housing off the market for um, permanent long-term rentals. Um, and then we've lost a lot of housing units. Uh, over 50% of our housing is over 50 years old. In some of our markets, um, the population has shrunk quite significantly over the last couple of decades. So some of it is we don't have housing where the people want to live. Um, and then in the cities that have shrunk, their house has decayed, and we've had some big demolition programs a couple of times um, through the federal government over the last um, couple of decades through uh, the, the NSP funds and hardest hit funds and... And so we've had some mass um, demolition happen. And so that's where we, why we are where we are today. Um, also, I just want to point out the fact that our housing in Michigan is expensive. Now, across the country, people will say the Midwest is not that expensive to live, which is true in comparison. But the cost of our housing has gone up. Um, over about the last decade, the cost of a for sale home has gone up about 84%. And during that same time period, our incomes have only gone up about 25%, um, you know, making the cost of housing out of reach for more and more Michigan families. In fact, I just got a stat from um, the Michigan Home Builders a couple weeks ago that said, you know, the cost of building a house on average in Michigan is $375,000. And we have about 4 million households in our state. Of the 4 million households, only about 1 million of those households could afford to buy a house at 375000 Only one out of, out of four, right? So we, we have uh, an issue with our families being able to afford housing. We also know that about 50% of the people that are renting today are what we call housing burden, which means they're spending over 30% of their income um, for, for the cost of housing, which is just too much. Um, you know, had I been sitting here 10 years ago in the sea, I would have said, we have an affordable housing uh, problem. We need more money for families that are 80% and below area median income, right? So now I'm here saying, oh no, this is up to 120% of area median income and, and above, which means the majority of Michigan families are ha finding it difficult to afford homes. More and more of our coworkers are having a problem affording homes. And, and I've shared this story with many over the last month or so because it just, it quite honestly breaks my heart. And I know it's not just Mishta that is having this issue, but many of you, but we, we have a, 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 an employee that's worked for the state of Michigan for, for many, many years who was evicted because of uh, red tagging Right? So what red tagging is, is if the landlord's not keeping the housing up, the city can come through with code enforcement and red tag, and that means you're pretty much evicted right away from your home. And she can't find another place to live. 
Literally, she has been couch surfing for months because she cannot find another place to live in the Lansing area that she can afford. Right? So this isn't, you know, typically affordable housing and housing issues get um, kind of a negative connotation that it's people who don't work or people that aren't working enough. No, it, it is hitting everyone in our communities now. Everyone. I have... Um, uh, businesses and school districts and local governments all coming saying we don't have enough housing for our workers. Um, and that's why we thought we were going to do this session today, to look at housing slightly from a different standpoint, to look at the impact that it is having on economic development in our state, the impact it's having on employers being able to attract talent in our state. Um, lots of good positive things have been happening um, from an economic standpoint across our state. We've had lots of big wins that you've probably um, heard about in the papers, and we're super excited for that. And, and with my Mishta hat on, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, where are we going to put all these people? And so we're here to talk about this. I'm so thankful to have um, people that I've worked with throughout the state, some for a really long time, and, and some new partners. Um, to kind of talk about this a little bit more, talk about what it, the, the, the scene is, the environment is across the state, talk about what we see happening, um, some positive, innovative things um, that are happening, and then kind of end up with what else can we do to address the issue. So that's kind of the map for where I'm going to take this session today. So thank you all for, for joining. Um, I'm going to start with just kind of some table setting. And, you know, we'll start on this side and just go down to make it easy. Um, but what are you hearing um, across the state from employers and how the housing crisis is impacting them? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for that incredible introduction. Uh, you know, not of us, but of the issue. Uh, on our prep call, actually, I'd asked you to go into, you know, that level of detail. And... Um, it, in three minutes, I think you, with incredible concision, summed up, uh, you know, exactly what we're facing as, as a state. So thank you for doing that. Uh, in terms of what we're hearing uh, as employers about the housing affordability crisis, you know, it um, it varies, I think, by regions of the state. In in northern Michigan, you hear all about how um, you do not have uh, enough housing for seasonal workers or for the you know the, for working folks, workforce housing in those communities. Uh, I'll tell you how we look at housing in, in Detroit. Um, you know, you may see in the papers the fight going on about, you know, contesting of the census numbers. You know, are we, you know, 680, 650, whatever it is. Uh, we need to, to grow our city. We need to grow our city. There's no question about it. A lot of the demolition that you referenced is, has taken place in the city of Detroit. Um, you know, we, as you said, um, where there's demand for housing, there's a mismatch, right? You, you made that point earlier, Detroit shrunk. We're very focused on creating conditions in the city of Detroit where people want to come back and live in the city of Detroit. And I'll just give you this last you know, uh, statistic. Um, our central business district, uh, prior to COVID, we had 80,000 office workers every single day. We were booming. We thought we could get Amazon. We thought you know, the sky was the limit. We had 6,500 residents. That's it. 80,000 office workers. Talk about, talk about being over-indexed to office. Well, you know, our office stock is now 50% physically vacant. Um, the future of downtown Detroit uh, is all about housing, is all about live play. So, um, you know, we want to help achieve your goal by getting at least a 10,000 housing units downtown and going from there. Um, so I, when you mentioned vacant buildings, I just think, ooh, housing opportunities, ooh, housing opportunities. Uh, Readaptive reuse isn't the easiest kind of development to do, but it's certainly pot, um, possible, and um, we're definitely here at Mission Detroit to try to partner to see that happen. Um, Shannon, I know that you're out and about throughout the entire state, so what are you hearing? It really varies, urban to rural. Uh, we're working statewide, and it's the same story. We're talking to economic development directors that have businesses that want to expand but simply can't because of the lack of housing. Uh, we currently have three projects in the Upper Peninsula. We're working in Munising, the home to Pictured Rocks, National Lakeshore. Uh, the, the local employers have to house people as far as 40 miles away. 
So, you know, even from a small business impact, it's, it, it's tremendously um, very difficult to be able to connect or bring in talent without access to housing. And locally, between Wayne County, Washtenaw County, um, the access to attainable and workforce housing is difficult. So we're seeing municipals step up to create new solutions on bridging those gaps through new mechanisms of funding that are coming down. But we're hearing that over and over, we're talking to groups like Cherry Republic, like Shorts, all of which are looking for vehicles to invest uh, and opportunities to, to invest and to take part in the housing initiatives underway. Now, as a city yeah. official, somebody, right. you get to hear every complaint. <laughs> All right. You know, I love that. I am love just going to say that when we were announced, you also got the highest claps. That did not go unnoticed. All right, right, right. I love that. <laughs> but you get to hear all the all the good things that are happening, but you get to hear all the complaints too. Yeah. Right. So what are you hearing from businesses? So I I, I can tell you that um, housing is it should be and is a, a key component to any economic development strategy. If you're trying to retain or you're trying to attract. You have to make sure that you're creating an environment where people can find actual housing, and we're uh, lacking in that, as, as, you, as you said before. I can tell you that um, we get a lot of large workforce development projects that come through the city, uh, and it's starting to, to, to happen a lot more that the, these large workforce projects are also coming with a, a desire to create and provide opportunities for housing, too, so there's a housing component to it as well. Um, and so. If we're going to if we're going to be able to um, uh, retain and attract, we have to create more housing, and and we also have to do it for people across the income spectrum, right? And so it's not only people who um, need affordable housing, low income affordable housing, and I I, I consider affordable housing not spending more than thirty percent of your income on housing. So it's it's middle income folks. There's people who are um, who can afford to do market rate, but they can't find the housing either. Um, and so if there is a demand for it, right, if there's an opportunity that we just have to meet it. Um, uh, I can tell you through these larger uh, development projects, the first thing people are asking um, uh, corporations and these companies is what are you doing about housing? And so it's like automatically coming with the, their development projects and, and push to bring workforce uh, to these, um, at least to our city. And so um, it, it, it comes all together. And, uh, and we haven't found any real separation from the workforce and the housing piece, and it's, and it's vital. And if we can do it, I think, um, and meet that obligation, we can really succeed and get a lot of people interested in our city. So Bob, um, you are last, but I have known you since my Genesee County Land Bank days. And that's because we were up there working with you guys on a land bank up in Traverse City, and you were having workforce housing issues. And I don't want to you know, put the date out there because it will make me seem as old as I am, but that was like 20 years ago <laughs> that you guys were talking about um, workforce housing issues. So how is that still impacting the businesses in uh, northern Michigan? First, Amy, thanks for letting me go last. <laughs> so I can plagiarize off my other panelists. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, housing and the lack of it is, uh, is one of the most difficult challenges businesses are facing up in the north. It's been that way for decades. It started with seasonal housing, you know, I mean, seasonal employees and finding housing for them. And I know Mackinac City, we see it with the J1s and the H2Bs, but it's now it's across the north. And uh, Chair Public alone has 50, 50 summer, I mean, 50 beds for my summer employees. And uh, it's grown over the last decade to now it's, it's really difficult to find year-round housing for my staff. We IT people, we're turning away more people that would love to come into beautiful northern Michigan to live because uh, they cannot find housing. It's to the point now where we're just starting to see how it's not only affecting employees, where new, uh, new business, businesses, uh, owners are getting older up in the north and they want to sell, but there isn't that next group of businesses, business people to come in and buy those businesses. And we aren't creating the businesses in the north right now 
because we just don't have the workforce. We just don't have the young people up in the north. Uh, yeah. I could go on and on. Well, I know. I, well, you know what? I'll tell one story. Yeah. Okay, because we were talking about a development, and we did. I did development about the same time we were working on Traverse City out in Little Empire, Michigan, and we developed 56 lots. And my goal, and why I wanted to be a partner with a bunch of you know, other uh, uh, do-getters in Empire was to, you know, to create some good housing. And for my goal was to create workforce housing. And now that development is about completed. There's 50 homes. I just called one of the neighbors that I remember you know, selling him a lot. And out of those 50 lots, there are only seven lots that have turned into houses that are uh, uh, people that actually work in the town. Oh. All the rest of the other 50 homes are second homeowners, uh, Airbnbs, and retirees. So seven out of 50 are people actually working. And that is across the north. Oh, that, that also breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Only seven out of 56. Seven yeah. Seven out of 50. And those four of those were ones where we did get count, some county funding and were able to keep you know, some control on those four. I think one or two of those are retirees now. You know, in my uh, travels across the state, um, I've heard from employers, uh, from small business, you know, it, small businesses all the way up to large corporations about the need for housing and how it's impacting them. And in fact, in the Traverse City area, I've had calls with the school district, right? That is like, we're going to build our own housing because we have no housing for our teachers. We can't attract teachers because we have no housing. So we're so desperate that we're going to do it ourselves, which kind of leads me to the question of, you know, what are you guys seeing out there as far as employers getting involved in housing so far, what are those deals kind of looking like? How are how are they playing into that? And with that, um, Shannon, I'm going to start with you. We have quite a bit. Uh, Washtenaw County and Ypsilanti, we were lucky enough to get a large allocation of ARPA funding. Same deal. Um, all of the ho homes will be deed restricted for primary residents, but uh, we are working with the local public school systems to target and we're, we're, we're leveraging philanthropic um, through the Ann Arbor Community Foundation to provide grants to the schools to look at teachers specifically. Uh, we got a call to model that out of Marquette Township that the township owned, you know, had a municipal owned piece of property. They wanted to target that towards middle income and 80 percenters, but also wanted to target first responders. Um, hospital workers and other large employment sectors. So we're, we're really starting to see the dynamic of investment. In Benton Harbor, we're partnering with Habitat for Humanity, but we have a $1 million grant from the Whirlpool Corporation uh, that will be a direct investment. So in almost every project between philanthropic and local employers, there's a need and a want to invest. As long, you know, and we're starting to see new tools that pr are providing those vehicles to make it happen. Okay. Um, so, Donald, I, I know there's a pretty creative P3 going on in Detroit, wow. and I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about what's happening with the Michigan um, Central Project. So, absolutely. And, and I, I, working with a lot of corporations, it's funny because I see Laura Granham and I, and, and we also have. Uh, Jared on his panel. So uh, Rocket Community Foundations and, and, and Bedrock have been instrumental to a lot of our corporate partnerships. But just an example of, because it's not only are we trying to build um, um, housing uh, for people across the income spectrum, and this is like a main economic development driver, we really also, when people go to work uh, here in the city of Detroit, we don't want people to leave right back out, right? It's like we need to retain them and, and spend their dollars and live, right? The, Work, live, work, and play is a serious thing we're trying to attain here in the city of Detroit. Um, but it, everybody knows about the, the Ford Foundation and their new um, location uh, at the train station. But we, uh, they were there um, with us the entire way. We put together um, a Choice Neighborhoods application. We won that. It was a nationwide uh, a competition. And we are trying to build 850 
um, units. And it's not just low income um, housing, it's, it's um, very, very low income, there's, there's uh, middle income, there's um, rental, there's for sale product, all different types of typologies really to make sure the, that, uh, that p we have an opportunity to keep people there and also um, attract folks. And, and, and Ford was at the table with us in those uh, conversations because they know it's going to be important. If they're going to be the innovators of the future, we have to make and be in a space where we're connecting with uh, folks from across the income spectrum. So that's, that's one. I also would say the Detroit Housing for the Future Fund, Julie Schneider's not here, but she is currently the housing director. Uh, we work together to uh, put together Detroit Housing for the Future Fund when we actually had um, uh, six corporate partners um, put money into this fund where we provide low interest capital for affordable housing. And so that you see that uh, our, our corporate partners also believe this, this is important. We've been able to raise $65 million. Um, that money is almost running out. Uh, so we're going to go out after it again. But um, you could see people are coming to the table and saying this is important to us and we want to you know, help solve this. So I want to just follow up on that. So they're investing money into a pool that is providing equity to housing and they're getting a return. That, that's right. It's, it's a small return, uh, but it's definitely it's a return, return that's lower than what you can, uh, uh, what we're seeing from uh, interest rates from, receive, from private yeah. banks. Um, and so it's, this, it's huge. And, and also, I, have, I would be remiss if I did not uh, talk about how Mishnah is playing a, a vital role in the, uh, in the Cork Town uh, uh, development project, because we have to bring low-income housing tax credits to that that process, and you guys have been extremely helpful for that. But it really takes coordination amongst uh, our private sector uh, partners and uh, in our public sector at the state and, and federal level. So. Well, I, I, I wanted to point that out because it, it's not a bad thing that they're coming in and they're investing in housing and getting a return, right? right? right like, right. I like that. That's one of the things that I want to help communicate to, to businesses is that, you know, we have... There are businesses out there that are developing housing. I mentioned that earlier because they really are, are, you know, needing to do that to find places for their employees to live. But they're also making money off of the housing they are developing, right? And so they're developing housing because they have no choice, but it's not a lost leader. So when we're talking about how businesses can get involved in housing, we're not asking for charity, Right? We're asking for investment, and I That's think right. it's important to right. talk about that. Investment means you have an equity state. You are a part owner. You will get a return if all goes well, which hopefully it all goes well. Yeah, oh, and yeah. so that's Absolutely. some of the things that we're looking at. So that's super Absolutely. helpful. Okay. Um, Bob, I know you got a lot of um, colleagues, and as you mentioned, you're working on housing yourself. Can you tell me a little bit about what the housing is looking like that employers are investing in in northern Michigan? How are how are they investing? And it's in numerous numerous different ways. And more than anything, the business are looking for partnerships. You know, if we can partner with uh, uh, the county, the townships, the uh, different organizations up in the north. I know that you know the Chair of Public is trying threefolded. One thing is philanthropy. We're donating to every organization up there because we just need more housing experience up there, people that have done it before. And the amount of agencies that are, you know, uh, that are developing up there is first and foremost. And then investments, personal investments. Uh, I think uh, Munson Medical Center is starting to buy their own housing. And I just saw an advertisement they put out where they're going to uh, give one year free housing to their nurses and a $10,000 signing bonus just to get people to come up north. Um, so I like that. So you have some of the traditional approaches, such as um, giving people housing stipends. Um, there are certainly um, the bonuses. We've seen employers get involved through down payment assistance programs where they'll help provide funding to their employees to purchase within um, um, a certain area that's close to their business. We've seen businesses purchase um, hotels and turn them into housing, create some tiny housing. Um, so people are trying to make it happen. I think we need to think about how we can help 
And so, Jared, I want to push this question to you, talking about maybe some of the current tools that we have in the state that would incentivize businesses. But what, um, what else do we need? That's a, it's a great question. So first, you know, um, we've talked about what employers can do directly. And I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, tell the story of Dan Gilbert moving to downtown Detroit, um, moving downtown because you know, he believed that the future of his company was talent, to attract talent. I need a vibrant urban environment. Uh, he had people in an office, and he realized, you know, really attract talent. Folks want to live near where they work. Young people don't just want to work downtown. They want to live downtown. And Dan got into to the housing game, you know, as a result. And, you know, we're thousands of units in with thousands more to go. Um, I don't think that's the solution. I really don't. I think it's kind of, you know, uh, one-off. Uh, I'm all for, you know, uh, employees participating in down pay down payment assistance programs, loan loss reserves, pooling capital, all good. I don't mean to, you know, dissuade it in, in, in the slightest bit. I think the fundamental answer, though, to our housing issues in Michigan have to come from housing policy, state and federal housing policy. So step number one that we need to do, which we've done, is invigorate MISHTA. I can't tell you how phenomenal it is to have a permanent director of MISHTA that has dedicated her life to housing. It is a, uh, it is a significant change from past administrations. That's number one. We need a dynamic MISHTA that pushes a forward-looking housing agenda. We have it. Big deal. Number two, we need investment from the state. At the end of the day, if housing has gone up 84%, and if it costs $375,000 to build a house, we have an inherent, implicit, inescapable workforce housing problem, right? We need state policy. We need subsidy. There's no other way around it. We need subsidy. Um, and then you got to work within fair housing laws to make sure that your workforce housing is truly for your workforce, and there's things like that to figure out. Um, but listen, in the budget right now, um, <clears throat> As part of the deal to invest in economic development, there was a political deal that was cut. I said, okay, we'll invest in the big you know, manufacturing plays, battery electric vehicles, but we're also gonna put $50 million a year for housing, $50 million a year for a few years into community development. We need to make sure that that is the minimum investment in housing community development, and that it's not earmarked for pet projects, but that it is for the production of housing. That's number one. Number two, the missing middle program. Uh, we need as much money as let's do let's go yeah. and let's think about frankly how can we deploy that as quickly as possible maybe thinking outside of the box and going through even I think Senate Bill 7 did $100 million, $150 maybe, to, uh, to supplement those projects. Let's do another uh, round of that investment. Here's the bottom line. We have a, a surplus in our state budget. Probably not going to have it again. It's probably our last year of a big surplus. So the question is, what are our priorities as a state? And I would submit that investing in housing production is, needs to be at the top of that list. Um, not only is housing security fundamental to uh, you know actualizing the rest of uh, of a successful life, but you know let's even look beyond our current population to growing our state. All the data suggests that folks who are moving across state lines and participating and contributing to the growth of a state, it's kind of common sense. They want affordable, high quality housing in, in a good, safe community that is amenitized, right? We, if we build it, they will come. I believe, I sincerely believe, but I'll tell you this, if we don't build it, they won't come. They won't come. We need to invest in housing. This is our last year of a big surplus. What can employers do? That's the question, that's the title of this panel. I think as much as employers can do down payment assistance, invest in pooled capital funds, they can go to Lansing. They can grab somebody here when they see a state legislator, a state senator, a governor, and say priority number one for this budget, you got four weeks to figure out your budget, invest in housing. That's what employers can do.
Well, I'm going to just explain. I just earned my trip back next year. Oh, no. <laughs> the the no. Missy Middle program, for folks that aren't aware of that program, it was a, a very um, flexible program that Mishta um, was a, uh, appropriated funds last year and some more this year, as Jared mentioned, a total of $100 million. Um, and it, it provides, it's very flexible in the fact that it's housing up to 120% of area median income. So again, it kind of goes up you know, to workforce housing. And it's for, it's for rental, it's for home ownership, it's for rehab, it's for new construction. So it's really whatever the community needs. And you know, at MISTA, we came out with the second tranche of that program with $80 million. And the very first day that that program opened, we got $220 million worth of applications on the very first day. Right, and so it does kind of show the need, the pent up demand for um, housing subsidy that you know is is climbing up the the income levels. So it's interesting that you mentioned that, but I just wanted to clarify for those of you that aren't familiar with that program what that is. Um, so I want to ask that question in to to some of our other panelists. So feel free to um, jump in with what what are the tools? What are some of the other tools that we might need in Michigan? to help employers get involved in housing? So I, I would echo the same thing Jared, Jared said. It, it, it really takes a policy. Are you just wanting the claps? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, because I mean, it's, it's very, so that's OK. He gets them. He it, gets them. It's very similar. So you know, and when I talk to uh, anyone, they say, you know, who is the, the largest provider of affordable housing? And they, they'll start naming developers. and the largest developers in the state of affordable housing. And I always say it's actually regular, everyday, private individuals, right, who live in market areas that their rents are going to be at that low income um, level. Uh, but there's no policy or anything that helps provide um, those individuals to help bring quality affordable housing uh, and deliver that to residents, right? Um, one of the policy changes, although it's not getting a lot of attention, is the fact that uh, the state legislature allowed uh, for municipalities to change the rules about pilots, which is the, the main uh, tax incentive tool that affordable housing developers use in providing affordable housing, right? You're, you're essentially taking off the tax rolls, and, and it helps you um, actually finance your development, right? Um, now that actual legislation allows for um, municipalities to change that, and so I can give that to somebody who doesn't receive a LIHTC or, mm -hmm. or a HUD um, a mortgage, right? So we can expand that and provide it to other individuals, which is something that we are internally working on right now in the city of Detroit. I, I would also, um, all right, yeah. <laughs> but I also would echo um, uh, the part, we need money, right? Uh, we need funding. We need more vouchers. We need all of those things, right? We're dealing with people who are in poverty, right? Um, uh, and and not necessarily can figure out their housing situation by just getting a job, right? And so um, we need, uh, on a federal level, the employers, right, to knock on doors to talk about allocating funds to this serious problem. Um, the LIHTC, I would say the Low Income Housing Tax Credit is the, the largest tool that we use for new uh, affordable housing production. We've had projects stall uh, since 2019, right before the pandemic, and we pushed the, the, the legislation that allowed for more gap financing to come and be used for some of those light tech projects. And if, if I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about that, but I know it's been um, oversubscribed. Yeah. Um, and you all, and Mishta allocated the funding for those projects within a two month time span. Right. And, and we were pushing for 500 million. I, the legislature provided 150. Um, and we're currently trying to get another 100, right? And that's right now, what I understand in the House, it's written, but not in the Senate. So if you, just to double down on that, if you see senators, uh, <laughs> please type on their shoulder and say, please put this money into, uh, into, this, uh, in, into this bill. So um, uh, again, I, I can't, um, um, it's not only policy, but it is a serious you know, putting a down payment where your, your mouth is, right, and really getting behind it. It's the biggest, like, I, I, if you're a corporation or a, a big business, I don't need you to figure out how to build affordable housing. What I need you to do is advocate for affordable housing. Right? Which, and the need for it. which brings me to a good 
um, a point. First of all, if anyone has a question, you can write it on the green card and put it up. I don't know if that was mentioned at the beginning, but just in case you have a question, I think we're going to try to save a, a few minutes at the end. Um, you know, we do have a, another tool that's making its way through um, the legislature, and that's tax increment financing, allowing for housing subsidy to be a uh, eligible activity for tax, in tax increment financing. That would be a huge win for us in the housing industry. Um, really puts a lot of control at the local level because the, the plans would have to be approved at a local level before they would come to the state. But what I love about that tool is it's flexible again. It goes up to 120% of area median income, but it's also for rental, for homeowners, for rehab, for uh, multifamily, single family. Like It's really for whatever the locals determine their housing needs are, this tool can be used for that. And then it can come to the state, um, hopefully, for approval for your, uh, oh. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're celebrating a little early. It hasn't passed <laughs> yet. It hasn't passed yet. Um, but hopefully, it, it has passed out of the Senate. It is has now, passed the Senate. Um, at the House. We're, we're very hopeful that um, you know, it will get passed um, in, in June, and we'll be able to begin to use that tool. Um, but one of the things that you said, Donald, has me wanting to ask the panel a question. And Shannon, you might be able to be really helpful with this answer, but um, others might as well, is you said that employers, we don't need employers to do housing, which is right. And the employers that I've talked to that are doing housing are not doing housing because they want to do housing. They don't want to be in the housing business. But we need to be able to connect those folks with the developers that do want to do the housing so that they don't have to do the housing themselves. Like, we still want them to invest and become equity um, providers or guarantors or all the different ways in which they can become involved in it because, quite honestly, we need more money and more people invested. So we do need them to get involved, but we don't need them to develop it. But Shannon and others, how, how do we connect them? Like, how have you found developers and why are some people not being able to find the developers or attract the developers to their areas to do the housing? Well, we have to remember, first of all, the corporate relocation market spends billions of dollars every year on, on housing mechanisms, and we can really catalyze that into our local communities. Um, but this was our conversation with you know, places like InvestUP, which is what are the vehicles, can, what type of vehicles can we have to invest in housing? And they received a legislative carve out for ARPA funding and have created two funds. Um, most recently, they, they met with over 100 of their local business leaders who made their, num their number one economic development priority housing. Um, we need to create loan loss reserves. We need to create social impact funding. We need to create pathways where employers can invest into housing. And you know, what we've really said is there's an opportunity to create regional funds, much like you know, Detroit has been very successful in having a you know, leverage fund for their housing. But we need to create uh, regional funding in which our employers can invest in, into housing. We've seen the demand. We've seen the opportunities. We've, we've had multiple corporations reach out to us that have wanted to invest. But we have not had that mechanism moving forward. And just to your point, Amy, I mean, what people need to understand is that we need programs like Missing Middle, but most of the truly impactful projects that are transformational need that leverage. We need housing TIF to be combined with Missing Middle. We need to stack complicated um, funding sources. We need to align all of these sources so they can work together to get these projects done. And that's policy all the way through to you know, the vehicles that can bring in and leverage as much investment as we possibly can. Before you go to that, yeah, let me answer. You know, for the North, what do we need is we need to simplify the criteria so that more money is just eligible to go North. There's a lot of handicaps we have. We don't have water and you know, plumbing, you know, like natural uh, sewer systems and some of that stuff that makes it uh, you know, a couple of checks against us. But if we you know, have some criteria that can overcome that, uh, and the, that would really help the North. And then also, uh, the second part is, uh, is just uh, allowing and making it simple for small five to 10 uh, unit developments. 
You know, we can put those all in every small town in America. Here, public, our goal is to make a f a f an apartment, you know, 15 apartments in the next five years. And, and that's a daunting task when you know real estate is at such a level with building. But uh, any money that'll help and, you know, make it simple would make a huge difference in, in making that for me and for so many other employees up north. Yeah, no, and, and one of our questions that came in is what are the challenges of doing rural housing? And you mentioned one of those, which is the infrastructure challenge mm -hmm. of trying to um, get funding for infrastructure, because a lot of times you do have to build out the, the basic utilities and roads to get the housing developed, which we all know increases the cost of housing. Um, I think another thing is something you mentioned with small projects. So a lot of our federal programs are really geared towards larger projects, right? And so really to kind of create some tools that will help fit the 10 to 15 unit housing project is tough, right? And that is one of the things that the tax increment financing would help with because there's, you know, that would be available for small and, um, and like the missing middle, which sorry, we have no money left in your region. So for, for all of you that know, we do try to at Mishta with most of our resources to spread them across the state in different regions. In some regions, um, you, know, you know, are a little bit more active than other regions. So we do have some issues with trying to attract development to certain parts of our state. And, I, and part of them are rural. Shannon, you've done a lot of rural projects and are working on rural. What are, just to fully answer this question, what are some of the additional rural development challenges that you see? Infrastructure, right now we're seeing, um, we're working in Midland in some programs, so recovery from the dam projects, um, septic right now, so expansion on small scale. You know, we're looking at innovative infrastructure to catalyze um, different opportunities and in, 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 in septic, uh, we have stormwater issues across the board. I mean, as we're starting to look at a lot of rural communities don't have um, really solid master plans that talk about, you know, what is their stormwater management plan? So, I mean, a lot of basic challenges really impact how development gets done. Um, you know, ultimately, it's just really capacity. They, there's a lot of folks that they, they no longer have planning departments in a lot of rural communities, so they're looking for third parties to help manage that process. Um, just they need access to tools, and, and they don't have access to developers there that can help walk them through what that process is. Yeah, we, we see capacity issues across the state, and I know that's something that a lot of folks are trying to work on is how do we get the capacity where it needs to, to be and how do we meet communities where there are. You know, at Mishto, um, last year at this conference, we talked about the statewide housing plan. Um, Michigan passed its first ever statewide housing plan uh, last year. Um, since then, the governor has appointed the first ever um, statewide housing partnership to um, oversee the implementation of that plan. And uh, we have created regional housing plan and kind of break it up into what works for their region. It's just like when you mentioned, Jared, you were talking about um, regional intermediaries and how do we get there. We know that each region isn't alike and they need different types of housing to meet their needs and different types of products. So, you know, we're trying to think a little bit more creatively at the state, at Mishta, on you know, if a region can tell us what they need, can we use some of our resources to meet them where they are, rather than creating a tool and saying, got to use our tool, I hope it works for you, because it doesn't work everywhere, because of the size of the deal, because of the type of the deal. So, um, you know, we're working really hard um, to do that. Uh, the regions are created. There's 15 regions across the state. Um, if you are interested in um, learning about the regions, you can go to Mishta's web website, and our map is there, and the regional leads are there. And I'm just going to, now that I have a captured audience, you know, get involved. Um, have your voices heard at the region. Um, be involved in what those plans look like, because those plans will matter. That's where we're going to try to um, put a lot of our state resources to meeting those regional plans. 
And it kind of gets to another one of our questions that came up about the development of single family homes. So a lot of our federal programs are geared towards multifamily, the low income housing tax credit project or process. Um, and it, it's been difficult to do a lot of um, single family homes because it takes a lot more time for the same amount of impact as uh, trying to do multifamily. And the subsidy per unit sometimes is more. Um, and you need more capacity to get it done. Um, so if any of you want to talk a little bit about how you have um, helped um, with single family homes, I know certainly the city of Detroit has worked in its mm -hmm. neighborhoods on um, developing new homes, fixing existing homes at the same time. Um, it would be interesting to hear a little bit about that. Well, uh, yeah, so I, I could tell you that uh, the city of Detroit, we won't be making its comeback without the neighborhoods. And so we need to figure out how to um, uh, really uh, take single family homes and, and, take, and take a look at that product and see how we can finance it and, and develop it and rehab it. Um, if the mayor was here, he would tell you about the Detroit Land Bank and the success that they had been, being able to sell homes in the market to private individuals and, and they're fixing them up right now. Uh, but, but it is difficult work, and a lot of people are not getting through uh, to the end of those development projects and, and making sure that they, they can happen. Um, I can say that there definitely is a market. Um, I can definitely tell you there's a desire. I have a, a long list of um, black developers who are interested in developing their neighborhoods, but the, the lack of capital and um, other uh, funding support uh, prevents us from, from really pushing that. And so um, it's something that we are, we're definitely looking at. And so we're also trying to see what we can do um, for new infill, not just rehabbing single family um, or, um, or duplexes, what have you. We're seeing where those markets conditions actually can survive so we can actually do infill. We have a couple of areas that I think would, would, be, um, it would be prosperous. Uh, but it, when I think of single family, I think about the neighborhoods and it's, um, uh, di directly impacting what we're trying to do. Um, uh, we, I, in my position, I also um, help manage the, the, the Strategic Neighborhood Fund, um, and uh, it's a fund that we layer different types of uh, investment approaches to neighborhoods, and one of those are not only does it help eradicate blight, but we are trying to rehab as many single-family homes as possible, whether we're working with um, our city partners or our community partners, and we've been able to rehab quite a bit, almost up to 200 single family homes in those neighborhoods. But it's gonna be vital, right, uh, to keep families here um, in the city of Detroit and we thrive here in the city by our neighborhood. So it's very important to us. Um, it's <coughs> interesting, we um, at MISHTA are getting the community development block grant dollars at our agency to deploy for the development of housing. And um, we did a quick survey across the state um, over the last month or so on how should we spend the CDBG funds for housing. And the number one thing that came back was single family rehab. So it's, I finally got some class. Yeah. <laughs> I said. But, um, and, and you know, I, I get it because we haven't invested enough in our state into preserving our neighborhoods. And quite honestly, it's harder to do because it takes a lot more um, time to do single family rehab, but it's actually more um, fiscally responsible to yes. fix the housing we have than to build new because we certainly don't need to typically invest $375,000 into investing or into rehabbing. So we're going to be looking at putting the majority of the, the first uh, 20 million of that out into to rehab for both homeowners and for, um, for renters because uh, all of the housing needs to be improved. And one of the things that I am concerned about is just, A, the, the capacity for um, the developers to do that, because it's a lot of work to contact and work with homeowners, yep. um, but also our contractors. It's hard to find small contractors to, to come and, and do that work. So we're going to have to continue to kind of work through that. But in our last few minutes, I want to get back to employers mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, we are constantly creating new programs or changing some existing programs at the state, at MISHTA, to meet the, the needs and, and what's happening. And, you know, we want to incentivize more people to get into the housing game because we need them, right? We need more resources. And so if we were looking at creating a way to incentivize employers 
to, to invest in housing. Now, it doesn't mean they have to own it. Again, there's lots of different ways to, to get them um, involved. What, what should we do? What should that program look like? I'm happy to take a stab at it and then pass it on. Uh, you know, this discussion actually is um, becoming more and more uh, to the forefront, not just here in Michigan, but in Washington. Um, they're trying, at least in the United States Senate, to come together with a bipartisan approach to housing. And one of the thought processes is, you know, it, it requires subsidy. How do we route that subsidy? If we route it through the employer, maybe that's the most politically palatable. And we do that in this country, employer-provided health care. You know, uh, so I, I'm not doctrinaire. I think, you know, that's definitely a, a way to go. Um, I want to make one final comment, though, um, that gets back to your question about single-family housing. I, I do think this is important. Look, at the end of the day, I think 80, 90 percent of the issue is, is subsidy and policy. Um, you know, the market won't do it alone if it costs 375000 The market doesn't do starter homes anymore, just like the autos don't build small cars anymore. The profit's in the big car, right? So you need policy, you need subsidy. I think, though, people who advocate for that you know, are dismissive at the same time of the argument that there aren't regulatory and other things that drive up the cost of housing production. And I think it is a mistake to be dismissive of those arguments, both politically and substantively. Uh, if you look at places like California, very progressive, want to do the right thing on housing. Los Angeles had a ballot initiative to build housing for homelessness million bucks a house it ended up costing. And it's because of this dynamic of what um, folks refer to as this everything bagel liberalism, where we want to achieve all of our policy goals through housing. We want to have you know, the most environmental labor, this, that, that, and housing becomes a million dollars. Um, I, I think it, uh, even though I believe 80, 90% of the issue is subsidy and, and directing you know, policy, I think it's the right thing to do to take a fearly, fearless, in searching inquiry as whether or not there are environmental, regulatory, permitting, zoning, other undue barriers that drive up the cost of, of housing. Um, I think uh, it, it'll help us politically. And if we find there's a problem, it'll help us substantively, too. And we may well find there's a problem. I think one more person can take a stab at the how, what should we do to create a program to incentivize employers. Listen, I, I, I love our Detroit Housing for the Future Fund. Just putting a plug on there, we're going to start our fundraising soon. Like I said, we've, we've had many corporate partners involved in that. And so we're going to be knocking on doors. Uh, we'd love to knock on a few more doors that haven't been involved in, in the past, but uh, we, really, we really want to make that happen. And again, um, even Mishta and, I, and I've looked at their uh, regulatory um, or their legislative uh, type of uh, key points that they're trying to push and prioritize. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys get to see that and also um, echo some of those things. And, and when you're talking to your, um, your elected officials, you're, you're saying that, like, let's push those legislative ideas and get behind that. And so those are, I think, are, are super key, right? Because it's, it's definitely policy and it's definitely, definitely funding. So we'll be knocking on doors for sure. All right, any last thoughts from Shannon or, or Bob? I, I think I said it. I, I, we definitely are promoting regional housing funds. Um, you know, having conversations with CDEs, CDFIs about loan loss reserves, about uh, certainly more creative mechanisms to encourage employers to come to the table. <laughs> I'll just say that uh, <laughs> I've been patient over these 25 years on this housing issue. And I don't think we've ever been in a better position to make things happen. I'm very excited that you've taken this leadership position, Amy. You're going to make a huge difference. Your skill set coming as a business uh, from the development side is going to make a huge difference. Uh, you know, there's enough tools that have been shown in the rest of this country that you are aware of that you can bring here. Uh, I think maybe this panel itself, well, I'll say it for all of us that... I think our future looks bright. We've got a big task ahead, but we're going to make it happen. And that, that feels perfect to end on, right? Like, we got a lot going on. We have more resources than we have ever had in the past. We need more tools in the toolbox, and we need all of you to care and to be engaged. So thank you for coming this afternoon. Thank you.